Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I've got the Arendal, I think it's Arendal, 1961 bookshelf speaker. Now, this is the lower line from Arendal, the 1961 is, and this is the little bookshelf speaker. I mean, look how small this thing is. And this is going to be important to keep in mind when we start talking about output capabilities, because believe it or not, this is one of the better speakers that I've tested in this regard. This is a two-way design with a 28 millimeter tweeter and a waveguide, as you saw. It has a five and a half inch midwoofer in a sealed enclosure. Very, very small crossover frequency of about 1500 Hertz and they cost $7.99 per pair. And I believe that does include free shipping, at least in the US. In terms of sound subjectively, what I heard, this is really quite simple. Um, it's an excellent bookshelf speaker. Very, very small, as I keep saying, because I, I can't, I just can't get over the the smallness. It's super compact, and I think that this is probably going to be. I don't I, I don't like using the word best, but it's probably one of the better options that's out there for somebody that has a smaller room if you don't have a lot of space to put a large speaker. It does come with a wall mountable plate. I did actually test it. This is the first speaker that I've tested in a wall mount configuration. We'll look at those results in a little bit. We're gonna start off with the full anechoic results for the free space measurements. But I just really do like this speaker. A lot of output, a lot of great linearity, excellent off-axis dispersion characteristics, very good control directivity from the mid-woofer to the tweeter. So the, the waveguide's doing a great job and the crossover point looks like it was chosen very excellently. I think that's a word. Um, so with, that kind of upfront stuff, let's get into the data and we'll try to bust through this pretty quickly and get you on up out of here. First things first, impedance. This is a four ohm speaker with a minimum of three ohms dipping around the 200 to 500 Hertz region. This is the CEA 2034 measurements. Now these measurements are taken using the Clipple near fill scanner. It is a state of the art robotic system that allows you to get anechoic data in a non anechoic environment, such as my garage, as you see here. The reason this is important is because it allows you to characterize the performance of the speaker without having to put it in a room. This gives you a better idea of how it's going to translate in performance to other rooms, other situations. And it's very important to know that as opposed to you just taking my word for how it sounds, we have objective data that we can correlate back to. Now, as I said, this speaker sounds quite nice and looking at this data makes perfect sense why. The on-axis response is pretty linear until you get to the waveguide region. Now, the high frequency treble where the waveguide really takes over, and, and I'm really talking about, for what it's worth, this area right here. There are some dips on axis. As you go off axis, they're still slightly there, but the further off axis you go, the less prominent they are. Are you gonna hear those dips? This is a question that I ask myself, other people ask, and the honest answer that I can give you is, without A being a speaker, with and without those characteristics, it's hard to say for sure just how problematic or how thorough you'll hear them. And you're not gonna find a speaker that has all the other characteristics to allow you to properly AB just that, that facet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play you some correlated pink noise real fast. This is gonna be flat. And then I'm gonna switch over to correlated pink noise with some parametric EQ to emulate this. And you see if you notice it and you see if it's a big enough difference. Now, again, we're talking about on axis and slightly off axis response. So keep that in mind because what you hear in a room is gonna be more of a culmination of the overall sound power or the early reflections, I should say, in the room. And that's gonna vary the response a little bit more, especially depending on how you had these speakers aligned, toed in, toed off axis. Now, I'll let you make that decision whether or not this is gonna be a problem. The average sensitivity is about 84 dB, which is not great, but with a speaker this small and the ability to get as loud as it can get, I think the sensitivity is not a big issue here in my personal opinion. We'll talk about compression measurements in a little bit. On the low end, this speaker rolls off pretty early, so you definitely want to pair it with a subwoofer, there's just no doubt. You cannot get by without a subwoofer with this speaker. It does have good bass, I'll, I'll certainly give it that, 
But if you're wanting that low end output, even below, I would say like 60 or 70 Hertz, you're still going to want a subwoofer. I think this speaker is best used as a set of front speakers with a good subwoofer. I would say cross that subwoofer over maybe up as high as 100 Hertz, or alternatively, you can use them as rear surround speakers. Now the orange dash down here is the directivity index for just the horizontal window. And that gives us a good idea of the EQ ability of this speaker. And if you follow it up, you can see that it has a pretty smooth trend line throughout until you get to around this eight kilohertz region where that, that dip is on axis. Although that dip isn't severe, you could actually EQ that on axis dip up a little bit if you wanted to. Again, it just kind of goes into whether or not it's something that you hear in your room. Personally speaking, I don't find it to be problematic with all things considered once it's placed in the room. And then this estimated in-room response kind of gives us an idea of why I say that, why I think that, or, or why my experience was that the on-axis dip wasn't as significant as the data lends you to believe, because when you're in a room, you have all of the off-axis reflections coming back at you. And ideally you want those off-axis reflections to sound about the same in timbre as the on-axis sound does. But those off-axis sounds also are a bit more even for this particular speaker. So they help to fill in that gap or that dip that's in the higher frequency area. And you can kind of see the general trend line from the speaker. So generally speaking, you can expect to have a little bit of presence region maybe knocked out just a little bit by about two to three dB in this one and a half to two kilohertz region. There's really nothing about the speaker that stood out to me in a negative way. I was just frankly impressed with the linearity, the output, and the overall ability to just sound good from multiple seats in my home theater without it being a huge speaker. Now we're talking about the horizontal off-axis radiation pattern. And this is a pretty constant directivity design and it trends toward about, let's see, plus or minus 40 degrees in the high frequency. And on the low frequency, it's about as wide as 90 degrees, obviously on the very, very low end. But if we go out to about 1.3 kilohertz, where you start to narrow up in response, uh, we're about plus or minus 70 degrees. The vertical response is pretty darn good, but we can see certainly that there is some narrowing in the mid woofer, mid range region. And then when we get to the tweeter, it goes wider in response. That's really just a function of having the two different drivers spaced separately on the Y axis. And unless it's a coaxial driver, most of the time you're gonna see something similar to this. And I will say that for this speaker, this actually looks pretty good. I, I like the fact that above and below the speaker is pretty symmetrical. Now in terms of output, this is an 86 dB and you can see I've got the 3% distortion threshold marked. And we don't even hit that until we get around 60 Hertz. If we go to 96 dB, now at about 100 Hertz, you can see the distortion has risen but it's still pretty dang low above that. You're at about 1%, which would be the negative 40 dB region uh, for the majority of the speaker's response. So it's, it's low in distortion. Now let's talk about compression. Now this is a really good measurement from a speaker this size. I mean, again, it's really, really compact and we don't really suffer any compression. I mean, relatively speaking, until you're below 70 Hertz, you're at a half dB of compression from 76 dB to 102 dB, that's fantastic. I mean, it, it that's fantastic even for a speaker that's twice the size. You can look at all my data from my other measurements to see why I say that. Now, here comes the on-wall measurements, and this is gonna be a separate topic that I'll discuss later, but right now I kinda wanted to give you an idea of what the performance is of this speaker when you put it on a wall. Keep in mind that pretty much every speaker out there once you put it on a wall, it's going to suffer the same effects that you're about to see, but I still think it's good information for you to know, and I will cover this more in depth in a later video. Now, this is the positioning of the speaker on my Clipple machine, and I will show you a short video right here. And if you're curious, yes, the Clipple software is able to basically uh, emulate a baffle, a full infinite baffle wall for the speaker. So even though the baffle that I created is not infinite, the Clipple software is able to detect the edges of my baffle and therefore mitigate the effects from the baffle loss, basically emulating then a full baffle. What we see here in the response is a pretty significant on-axis dip. This occurs with every on-wall speaker that you'll ever see, unless it's 
just it designed to not have that. And I don't know of any out there that are designed to, to account for this. Right here, we are looking at the frontal hemisphere, and this graphic actually has five degree increments, and um, I may fix that, but for now, I just wanted to address that because most of my other graphics have 10 degree increments. So we can see as we go from on axis, you have a big suck out like we just saw up here, and as you go off axis, that suck out varies in frequency. So basically, as you move around the speaker, that on axis dip shifts in frequency higher and higher. Now the vertical response shows us basically the same thing as we saw before, but again, with a pretty big suck out right to the middle. All of this data is on my website, which is aaronsaudiocorner.com. I'll drop a link below. To sum everything up, great objective data, a great sound. You're gonna to need to subwoofer, play around with toe in, toe out a little bit. If you decide to put them on a wall, keep in mind the data that I showed you, you are gonna have a suck out depending on where you're sitting. I forgot to mention that this speaker came from Arendal, so thank you to Arendal. I was not paid for the review. They actually did not see the data. They haven't seen this video uh, before anybody else, so they just loaned it to me, and I reviewed it like I normally do. But for full transparency, I just want you to know that's where the speakers came from. And with that said, I'm out. I appreciate you watching. If you don't mind, subscribe, hit the thumbs up, hit the notification bell, all that cool stuff if you're looking forward to seeing more stuff. If you would like to support the channel, you can do so by joining my Patreon, patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, or you can use one of my generic affiliate links below to buy anything from speakers to underwear. It's always good to have clean underwear, so keep that in mind. All right, I will talk to you all later. Have a great weekend. Peace.